Oh my goodness, it's so good to see people in the seats again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so welcome, and welcome to all of you here in the Library of Congress's Coolidge Auditorium. And welcome to all of you who have joined us from afar and are watching our live streamed broadcast. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Tonight kicks off a three-day celebration in honor of the 2022 Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song honoree, Lionel Richie. And for us, it is particularly poignant because the last time we awarded the Gershwin Prize, it was to Garth Brooks, and the date was March 4th, 2020, the week before the, the world shut down. So now we're all returning to concert halls and um, uh, so, sorry, since we are a library and we use library metaphors, it seems like these two Gershwin Prizes are bookends for the pandemic. <laughs> but it, it is a truly a joy to be back. Now, I'm sure that when you think of the Library of Congress, you wonder, how many books do we have? But since this is a musical event, I'm here to tell you that we have much more than books. Our mission is to collect and preserve this material for posterity, to keep it safe for the American people. And in the music division, we hold close to 25 million items, including operas and symphonies and other classical music, popular music, and um, notes on paper, literary manuscripts, microforms, copyright deposits, and many fantastic musical instruments. We have six Stradivari instruments, and we have James Madison's flute. But what is particularly amazing is that we also collect the papers of important composers and artists in the field of music, theater, and dance. We are particularly rich in American composers and songwriters' papers and music. From Irving Berlin's original manuscript scores for God Bless America, to the papers of Leonard Bernstein, Oscar Hammerstein, Jonathan Larson, and Jesse Norman, to name a few. The library has, sorry, the library has received an amazing array of materials that collectively chronicle centuries of human achievement in music, culture, and arts. The generosity and big-heartedness of many have built your neighbor, nation's library. Of course, I must make mention of one of the most prized collections in the division, and that is the inspiration and guiding light for the Gershwin Prize for Popular Song, that of George and Ira Gershwin. This collection contains such classics as Rhapsody in Blue, the musical manuscripts from Gershwin's stage and screen shows, and a wealth of manuscripts, printed music, photographs, correspondence, business papers, scrapbooks, and iconography. The library has George's piano, which Lionel played on this afternoon, Iris' typing table, and typewriter. Our collections are open to all, and I invite you to come and take advantage of them either in person or online at loc.gov. The Library of Congress Gershwin Prize for Popular Song is reserved for and granted to the musicians, songwriters, and singers who have reached the highest levels of musical achievement. And tonight, we are here to hear from one such supreme being, Lionel Richie. I hope you are ready to enjoy a very special conversation between two amazing people, the sublime Lionel Richie and our own special celebrity, the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. So as you know, one of the library's missions is to preserve the nation's cultural history. <clears throat> Therefore, we do conversations like this one tonight, oral histories of important people in the music business and we, we record and preserve them for posterity in our archives. 
So now I have the delightful task of introducing the woman who leads our amazing library, the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, along with the incomparable Lionel Richie. Thank you. Where do you want me? Okay, it's a bad pun, but you all could do that all night long, right? <laughs> I, I had to say it. I had to get it off. I had to start that. You want me on the side? All right. Right Good. on the other side. Well, it's quite all right. Quite all right. Well, Mr. Richie, <sighs> and welcome to all of the people watching us online. How are you? Because there's Very so good. many people watching. This is, as you know, one of our first in-person events, and we couldn't think of a better occasion and a better person oh. to bring us back, so thank you. Uh, we are back. We are back. We are back. We are back. And so, the Gershwin Award. You, you rock and roll Hall of Fame, all of these, the Oscars. She said, can't hear me, I'm a librarian. Shh, I'll come it up. Rock and roll they, Hall they, of Fame. They can't hear you. <laughs> I am excited. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta learn that too. But the Gershwin Award, George and Ira Gershwin, songwriters par excellence. You all have no idea. I, I mean, I can honestly tell you, I've been around the world and around the world, and, and um, ironically enough, of all the things that were on my bucket list, this was not one of them. In other words, it was so far out in space, you just, that's something else that happens. Um, when I got the call, it was a moment of thinking, is this real or am I being punked? <laughs> and then I realized, oh my God, it's real. And I mean, when you say Gershwin, that's the, that's the holy grail. That's it. And as a songwriter, this is just beyond my comprehension. Because to start out in Tuskegee, Alabama, <laughs> to start out in Tuskegee, and then you start talking about the Library of Congress, and the George Gershwin, award in Ira. It is beyond my um, comprehension. Even right now, I'm on stage. There's two people you're watching right now. The person who's the spectator going, oh my god. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the other person, Lionel Richie, going, of course, I've done this for years. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but this is way out of bounds, because I don't really quite know how to accept all of this. But it is um, because when I got into the business, I was going after Stevie. I'm going after Marvin, going after Elton. I, I wasn't going after <laughs> George, <laughs> Gershwin. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a little different. Now, Tuskegee, you, know, you went to Tuskegee College Absolutely. and stuff, so it's historically black college. Absolutely but a, a hotbed for music and excellence. What was that like? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, born and raised on the campus of Tuskegee University. Thank you very much. And, and had the pleasure of having William L. Dawson come by my house every day, the Negro um, folk symphony, and would work with my grandmother on pieces that he was writing, and they were in the other room. And the only thing I had to do to make sure I got out of the house, he would quiz me on whatever language he just left. So if he left France for a concert, I'd have to say something in French. 
he scared me to death. And then I slipped out through a side door. But Tuskegee was basically probably the best thing that ever happened to me because I was raised by some pretty amazing people. The Tuskegee Airmen were my, I mean, <laughs> you know, the Tuskegee Airmen, we didn't know they were famous <laughs> until I was about 13, 14, because America didn't recognize them. When you watch the 20th century with Walter Cronkite, we didn't see the Tuskegee Airmen, we didn't see any black troops, but yet, the funny thing about growing up in Tuskegee, we had black men who would go to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. They would salute them, give them carte blanche, but they couldn't vote. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, okay, well, what's that all about? Because they kept us in what we call the bubble. And on this university campus, they gave us a lot of permission to get away with things that we didn't know we were supposed to be able to get away with, like think for yourself. And we had little missions. Uh, failure is not an option. Um, not realizing that they realize they might not have the opportunity, but if we do, this is your shot. This is what we want you to do step forward. So, just imagine, I grew up on a, in a town where everybody was a doctor, a lawyer, double PhDs, um, airmen. In fact, when I was growing up, we had Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Air Explorer Scouts. So we were flying at the age of 12. Um, not realizing that I was going to be a pilot, I was just kind of naturally thinking that this is what everybody was doing. <laughs> and uh, I quickly dropped out of the pilot program when they said, you can take the plane up by yourself. Ooh, yeah. I ain't going no place by myself. In the not in a plane. But I mean, the experience of being on the campus was amazing because the great part about HBCUs is they didn't prepare you just for academics. They prepared you for culture and how to handle yourself in life. So there was a part where we had the art and lecture series where you could go and watch anyone from Odetta to a ballet troupe. Now, of course, at age seven, eight, nine, it was the most boring thing that I ever sat through in my life. <laughs> but my grandmother and mother and father insisted that we go. And of course, check. Do we know anything about ballet? Yes, we do. Do you know anything about symphonies? Yes, we do. And so once you experience it, it becomes a part of your little treasure chest of things that you, that you know about. But having that as a background, all of those amazing people. Of course, that was when segregation was strong. And then as soon as integration came in, all the big schools dissolved, basically, because now all those jobs are available to anywhere in the world. Now, you mentioned your grandmother again. <laughs> so she was, you said, on the piano with William Dawson. So she was a pianist. What about her? A.M. Foster, Adelaide M. Foster, was the grand dame of my family and my life and Tuskegee University. My, um, my grandmother, on the deed to my home, uh, is Booker T. Washington's sister's name. Uh, Grandma was the cultural fanatic. And so with her, you can imagine when I was growing up, I couldn't imagine it, but I said, what did you put down that you wanted to be when you grew up? And she said, I wanted to be a classical pianist. Now think about this, this is 18, <laughs> whatever, you know, 1902. 
And she had the wherewithal to say, I'm going to be a concert pianist. And so goes the adventure. She ended up where she wanted to be because she was an instructor on the campus of the university. She graduated from Fisk University and was with the Jubilee Choir. And then from there, um, she had her dealings with me, uh, well, which was a terrible disappointment. Okay, now I, I, I had a note here. Yeah, yeah, I, I figured I you might have a note down there. Now, but you did make it up to her later in life. I did. With Placido Domingo. Yes. Okay. Yes, I did. I want everybody to know. Yes, I, I, I But there I, was a moment. I redeemed myself. That's what we called it. So let's just put it out there. Okay, so first of all, my grandmother tried her best to teach me how to, to read and write music and to pay attention and be a studious person. What she didn't know, and what I didn't know either, was back in the day, I was called hyperactive. Today they call that ADHD or ADD or... How about talented? Confused. Ah. <laughs> I could have used you. No. Right. I needed you back yeah. then. I needed you back then. That's what we're learning now. Well, the whole concept was I was living somewhere else in my brain. And so what I didn't know I had the ability to do was she would play it and I would watch and then she would leave and say, work on it and I'll be back in a minute. Well, she would come back and I'd play it from beginning to end. And she said, I'm not teaching you anymore. And I said, why? I said, that was perfect. She says, you didn't read the music. And I said, why do you know I didn't read the music? She said, you didn't turn the page. That's right. <laughs> there you go. So I had a dip right there in my career because at that particular moment, I was basically useless. Because if you can't read music, you, you can't be in a concert pianist's home and you can't read music, it's ridiculous until my first hit record, <laughs> where I found it very interesting that it is possible to pay off your parents. I know that sounds terrible, <laughs> but the greatest pride in the whole world is when you join the Commodores and you walk in the room with this afro and platform shoes and sideburns down to here, and ah, oh, and I found. Oh, your grandmother saw that? She saw all that. She saw all of it, because all of it was happening in her basement. Mm. And she would just look out, and there's one word that you understand, which is not a word, but you know it's, it means disgusted, and it goes, mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> know it well. Know it well. Now, if you grow up in a house where they don't say much, but you hear, mm, <laughs> that says a lot. So I went through a couple of years uh, of that, and my father came in the door and tried to talk to me, talk some sense in my head, said, son, <clears throat> join in that band of hoodlums. But they were students, right? Yes, they were, but according to my father, that was not exactly what we were looking for, you say. <laughs> Yeah, and not after all this education has got to be, and I'm having the best time of my life. And so I found that your parents' attitude will change instantly when you say, Dad, I got a million dollars right here. <laughs> and instantly, my son, <laughs> my son, I knew it all the time. <laughs> oh. And of course, from that point on, it was, it was to the races. I had no problem. My dad was my best supporter. And I actually caught him lying. Excuse me, I mean, telling Barbara Walters. Oh, no. <clears throat> Barbara Walters. We had the uh, uh, Barbara Walters show at the house. And my father got up and said, it is the job of every parent to stand firmly behind the child <laughs> as they pursue their endeavors at night. And I looked at him and said, that's not what you said, Dad. You said you're going to kill me. That's what you said. <laughs> but the point is, that 
change in talent was the beginning of, oh my God, I think I know what I'm doing. And that was the part where you step into your being. I realized at that point from Tuskegee, because if you grow up on an academic or in an academic world, the, the whole concept of academics is there is a logical reason why you know what you're doing. If you take medicine, you went to med school. Law, you went to law school. Teaching, you went to teach. Writing music, there's no logic. There's only 12 notes. And I started interviewing artists. Um, Marvin Gaye was a perfect example. Because I was doing my little schoolwork, not knowing I was a writer still. And I asked Marvin, what conservatory did he graduate from? And he said, what the hell is that? <laughs> Life. And then he started doing some stuff. And he said, can you hear that, little brother? Yeah. He said, OK. He said, you're a songwriter. But if you can't hear, can you hear that song? If you can't hear that song, you're not a songwriter. And then I realized that everybody at Motown, well, artist-wise, didn't study music. Smokey, greatest songwriter in the world, as far as I'm concerned, but he never bothered to go to school. So that's when I had permission to step out of my academic head of self-worth and step over into, well, I can kind of write my own story. And of course, as you get one in, then the next happens, the next happens. There's a word called confidence, and then you take off. However, my notes say. Check your notes there. <laughs> <laughs> that you were doing good, the Commodores, everybody was happy, yes. you were on the stage, yay, 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 yay. However, you said and went and made sure that you got your degree. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I had to. It was very important, and I, I knew it. I mean, listen, you can, you can talk all day and try to flatter your folks by saying, um, you know, I got this hit record, I have this going for me, I've got this concert, we're sold out over here. Eh. I came from a, a solid black family, from a solid black community. And there was only one basic hit record that you get as the rite of passage, and it's called a degree. If you don't have an education, because my dad and mom and grandmother and the community, and the town, and the airmen, they always had fallback position. They'd always look at things as a military strategy. So OK, so if, yes, I know you're winning, but what's your fallback position? Well, fallback position was education. I'm an economics major, and I'm an accounting minor. And thank God I never had to use it. <laughs> 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 because it was just one of those things that was just not going to be interesting at all for the rest of my life. But what it did for me was it gave me a foundation, and I went back to school for a year, toughest stuff I ever did in my life, and finally um, um, received my um, degree, and um, it was done. It was good. And I gave it to them. Oh, yes, you And did. I have a picture of me giving it to them. And I said, you hold this for me for safekeeping. And I never used it again. <laughs> I never used it again. <laughs> but somebody has it somewhere. So you're on campus, and you meet these fellows, and you start this group. Well, you're going to go back there. OK. Yeah, well, I'm mean, okay. at that age. I got it. I got it. Yeah. So you all are rocking and rolling. You decide to get your degree. And then you started, when did it start dawning on you that, you know, like you said, I can write. Oh, no. It, like, for well, everybody. Well, the, the, if you want the true story, <laughs> and since I'm here. <laughs> you're in the library. We want to make sure we document this properly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So it was, how did I get in the band? How did we form the band? That was based on one very strategic goal. Girls. That was it? We had no idea of money and didn't care. All we knew was, if we started a band, we could meet all the girls on the campus, <laughs> period. Everything was fine for a while until uh, we signed with Motown. I jumped ahead now. And it never meant anything to me except having fun until Milan Williams, the keyboard player to the Commodores, wrote the first hit record, Machine Gun, and received for his first check $35,000 cash. Bam. It was that point I said, hmm, <laughs> I may need to be a songwriter. <laughs> and then, of course, from then on, well, it's very simple. Right down the hall, that's, that's, guys, am I, is this going to make it worse? Because I'm touching. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm coughing, so we're quite a pair. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm a sticker to this. I can move it down. Is it okay? All right, you came in? Every time problem. I make a, I'm such a sticker to this stuff, I'm sorry. Uh, so what happened with this, it, it now comes into the fact that I can now write these songs. Where was I going with this? I'm sorry, I was trying to tell when you. When did you start making that shift to, I can write the songs, and that $35,000 check might have my name on it? ADD, ADHD. Talented. I'm the poster child. It was at that point I realized that I was going to be a songwriter, and then I started realizing I need to go interview some songwriters. And they happened to be right down the hall. And then I started realizing that songwriters have a situation. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, now we can work this right here. <coughs> songwriters became a whole nother word because I didn't realize that there's a whole business, publishing, there's writers. And as I started writing, I realized, well, Smokey Robinson makes royalty checks. Marvin Gaye makes royalty checks. Well, that's called, oh my God, that's, a, that's income. That's what my dad was talking about. Do you have a job? <laughs> and I said, well, to have a job, you have income, songwriter. I didn't know I was going to be a singer quite yet, but songwriting was close. Because here's what you don't know. I became the lead singer of the Commodores because I sang the songs that I wrote. Clyde, the drummer for the Commodores, was the lead singer. I only had one song to sing throughout when we first started, and that was um, Wichita Lineman. Oh, oh. Can you imagine that? So, it, the, but the point I'm saying is, once I discovered it was a business, then the lights came on. And then I had a chance to meet Alan and Marilyn Bergman. Oh, you know, I mean, you, or, you know, Henry Mancini. You know, and I remember asking uh, Hank Mancini, when do you go on the road? And he said, I can't afford to go on the road. I make too much money staying home. <laughs> So this was a business that I terribly got fascinated with, having no idea that I would ever be standing right. on this stage here. And so when did you start realizing, well, I can do country and all the other, or was it just the nature of the songs that lent themselves to that? Or? I, I, yeah, I think, I think what you all what you all have watched over the years probably came as a fascination to me as it was to everyone else. I did not write on some philosophy that I'll, I'll go country now, I'll go classical now. I just sat down. My problem was I didn't know there were categories. 
I didn't know that there was, R&B was supposed to be for the black folks. Pop was the white folks. Country was the country folks. I didn't know where to go with that. <laughs> jazz, jazz was j jazz. I didn't know, uh, so I got in the business thinking I'm going after Billy Joel, Elton John, uh, you know, Stevie, you know, Marvin. I didn't, I didn't know. So I had a lot of problems at the beginning because they, they were saying, well, what's wrong with you, man? You, you ain't trying to be black. And I kept thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. I've been black my whole life, so when did I? <laughs> but they were categorizing the fact that I had to play a certain kind of music. And so it took a minute for me to get used to my avenue, but I didn't plan on writing a classical song. It's, I grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama, in my house classical music, my grandmother. On the campus, the gospel choir. The neighborhood, radio station, country music. You follow me? So what you have is a melting pot. Oh, excuse me, and I love jazz. So I had a melting pot of sounds and things happening in my head, so when I wrote, I didn't realize that Easy was gonna be kind of country or it had a twang to it. I didn't realize it. I just wrote it. So it, it, it came out the way it came out just because of my whole environment, probably. The best answer. So you brought up easy, so we have to ask. So it just flowed. How, how, what's your process? Because the collections here, <laughs> yeah. we showed you some of the things uh, earlier, uh, the George and I regret. You, you, you blew me away. And the process. All right, so this is, this is when it gets kind of strange. Because, no, it, it really is. I, I mean, I must tell you, because people ask me all the time, tell me, come on, what, how do you do what you do? Um, I receive music. Let me just be real strange about this for a minute. Um, there are only 12 notes. There's only, it's very simple. All you need is three to make anything work. I know that may sound strange to a lot of you if you're in the music business, but it doesn't require a lot. It's called the melody. And so for me, I have figured out in my brain, I know how to navigate 12 notes. Now, how it comes to me, it's very simple. It just comes. Any time, any place, just... It, I could be talking to you right now on this stage. Oh, get the tape. <laughs> As I adapt myself. <laughs> I could be talking right now on this stage, and if you see this happening in the middle of a conversation, I am not with you right now. <laughs> now, my mother and father used to call that, stop fidgeting. Oh. Uh. Stop fidgeting. My instructors in school saw that and they would say, Mr. Ritchie, would you like to join the rest of the class? That means I was daydreaming. What I didn't know was that daydreaming is me on the other side. Now, when it starts off, it starts off where you catch it in blinks. And those are your first couple of songs. And you try to remember all that you can remember before you got back over to conscious. And then as time goes on, I can leave the door open as long as I want and go in and stay there for a while. Which means I'm not present on this side. What happens when I'm over there I hear wonderful, wonderful phrases of love, like, <clears throat> Lionel, you're the most irresponsible person I've ever met in my whole life. <laughs> the, the meeting started at 8.30, you showed up at 10.15. What were you thinking? I was on the other side. It, it comes when it comes, 
And when it comes, you don't want to come back. Until it's finished or what? What's that? Until it's finished or what? Until you get the whole idea out. Right. Now, the problem is with that is that you're not reliable on this side of making dates and places and you said you were going to come and da 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 da. There's a reason why Stevie wondered the joke of all of us. When Stevie says, I'll see you later, Next that year. means sometimes this year. Yeah, we've heard about that. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean tomorrow when you need him, but I understand. I mean, he, 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 he got involved in the other side. Well, to answer your question, my process is very simple. What I do is I write the hook first. If I don't have the hook, because my mother was an English instructor, so it's like writing a, a, a paper. The, the subject is easy. Tell me about it. Well, by the way, you only have four lines. So the first line has to be something that you, lets you know where we're going. I know it sounds funny, but you just can't stand the pain. Girl, I'm leaving you tomorrow. Ah, first two lines. Which means it's a song about leaving, and you know it's a breakup. Seems to me, girl, you know I've done all I can. Follow me? You know where, so in four lines, you know exactly that's why I'm easy. Follow me? It's only four lines of expression. You have to get to the point as fast as possible. And the part I like the most is, thank God I don't have to write that much. You just have to write the correct ones. The only difficult part about writing is the English language has so many different words. <laughs> you could spend a lifetime picking the wrong words. So, picking words, working with someone, what about We Are the World? Because with everything that's happening now, that song has come up. Did you hear her segue? <laughs> Did you hear her? You are really good. <laughs> my parents were musicians. That was, no, that was good. Okay, so you went from my process <laughs> to We Are the World. Okay, so I had the very dear pleasure of writing that song with my very dear friend who departed early, Michael Jackson. Um, and the irony of that song is that it is more valuable today than it even was back then because of the stupidity and the inhumanity of man. It is absurd to me, and it was absurd to us back then, that we had to write a song to raise money to save human beings. How absurd. And so we sat there and uh, we wrote this amazing anthem. And I will tell you the process of this. Normally, I would never oh, please, you got reveal. Got you. But since I'm here at the library. I want this to be known throughout the world. So we were sitting there, and, and Michael and I, uh, we, we're very visual in how we look at things. So we were trying to figure out, <clears throat> it can't be a song where you go, it can't be that. We need something powerful. So what word comes to mind is anthem. We're not writing a song, we're writing an anthem. Okay, so let's go through the anthems. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba, ba. No, 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 no. Ba, 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 ba. Stop right there. Okay, keep that going. That's the root really? of the song. Now, we put on top of that the words, the melody. 
and that's how we wrote that. No words, no melody, but the root was the rhythm. The rhythm was familiar to you because you've heard that every time in life. There's something anthemic. Boom, 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 boom. And here come the Greeks. Boom, boom. The answer is, that's where we started from. The rest of it was probably one of the magical mystery tours of life <laughs> because I had to survive the... Michael has pets. Which ones did he bring? Oh my God. So, we have the, we have, da 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 da, we got the whole thing. Okay, we're trying to write the, the melody, I mean, the, excuse me, the words to the song. There comes a time, the whole thing. And out of the corner of my eye, I see some records falling over. Now, I'm, we're both lying on the floor with a tape recorder, we're running it back and forth. And I look over, and there is the largest snake I've ever seen in my entire life. As I am, well, <clears throat> in my book, I will say that I was calm. <laughs> but because I'm here at the library, <coughs> Excuse me. I will tell you the truth. Up. Sorry. I was screaming like the last horror movie you ever saw in your whole life. I was screaming so loud, and he was trying to tell me, there he is, Lionel, he likes you, I found him, I didn't know where he was, oh my God. He, and I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? Well, what he told me was, he lost the snake in his room. And he knew he was in there somewhere, that's why he kept the door closed. And because he heard us singing, he wanted to come out and meet me. He liked you. He liked you. He liked me. So therefore, we wrote We Are the World under that kind of pressure. Quite a bit. But yeah, we did. I was, I was, I've never been right since. But, but I look back on that now, and again, we knew where to go. He understood. We didn't have to sit there and go, um, what do you think it should be next? No, da 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 da, he goes, da 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 da, I go, da 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 He knows how to do it. I mean, in other words, you're either in that vibration or you're not. If you look at pro basketball players, now yes, one plays for one team and one plays for the other team, but when they play all pro, all star, you know, when they, they can throw the ball behind them. Well, how do they know that? They're not on the same team. They understand. Well, that's the way it is in the frequency. Once you tap into God, once you tap into that universal thing, you can, re you can receive all day. You just have to be open enough to receive it. And look at the great things we have going on today. I mean, like right now, I'm, I'm going to segue back to what you were saying at the second half of your question. But we've got so many minds now coming up with so many beautiful things. They're so far out in left field, we don't know where they're going with it. In fact, mankind can't keep up with the new innovations that are coming along. But there was a mind who thought about that, who saw it, and brought it back from that fifth dimension. Now, let me give you the second half of your question, we are the world, of what's happening today. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy that we're allowing this and all behavior that does not fall under my grandmother's rules, that you treat someone the way you want to be treated, you act the way you want to be treated. We have watched the movies of barbarians tearing down walls, but the problem is we didn't have the internet. Now we know what barbarians look like. And we are allowing it to happen. Now, there's no such thing as a leader that will lead us to hell. We let them lead us to hell. Now, what we have to do now is take charge of our planet. No one, there's a choice we're making. 
we're saving our own lives. It means I tried to explain to people years ago. You save the starving people in Africa because one day it's going to be at your doorstep and it might be you. And if they don't have any training in saving people, you're going to die too. Okay. They're bombing downtown D.C. in the Ukraine. They're bombing your neighborhood, and they just blew up your house. And the world says, well, we're thinking about what we do about that. Really? How much longer are you going to take? Problem is, we're taking too long. We're going to lose mankind. And I'm afraid that the words that we wrote 30 some odd years ago still applies. So when someone says, you need to write a new song, <laughs> the answer is, I already wrote it. Just listen to it again. That's where we are right now in the world. I like that. I might, I might, I might take you on the road. This, is good. this could be good. A good team. Truth teller. And she can sing. My parents, the uh, reason why I was smiling throughout, you know, when you're talking about Tuskegee, I was born on the campus of FAMU at Florida a &M. Two classically trained musicians. That's why I'm oh, really? a librarian, though. I think you well, did the million dollar check. I'm at the library. Hey. <laughs> You know, you know, what I will say, though, that, that what I gathered from you instantly when we first spoke on the phone and now meeting in person, the greatest thing about having a job is when it's not a job. And you are not working at a job. No. You are having so much fun. I will tell you, when we first met, she just opened up and was telling me every step of a walk over here is this, over here is that, we have this, we have Scott Joplin, we have the... You love what you do. Well, thank you. And God bless you for that. And you do too. <laughs> Takes one to know what. So, questions, but before we do questions, we have a little surprise for you. And I'm gonna bring Sue Vita back. Now, now. Uh, Cause I told you we're bringing out the good silver. I know there's, <laughs> she did say that. <laughs> I can't uh, now, now, I know there's a secret handshake you're supposed to get or something, right? Uh -huh. And the, the initiation, right? Something. Uh-oh, uh -oh, this is it. Uh-oh. Is this working? Or give her. All right, am I standing? Where's the technician? Where's my tech? We're getting fancy. That's what happens with earrings. No, I get it. No, with, I get uh, it. Masks. Okay. Good. Now, all right. Please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. All right. Gee. Okay. Is this going to hurt? <laughs> <laughs> Only if I. <laughs> but I okay, think I'm right. Vanna White, right? <laughs> yes, that's okay. Right. I'm supposed to be right. Vanna White. So, uh, if you recall, when we did our uh, visit to Los Angeles and did the oral history with you. Yes. I gave you a facsimile of a um, uh, song that had a map of Tuskegee campus on it, and it was called the Tuskegee March. And what we try to do when we have wonderful people like Lionel here, we try and give them some kind of a memento. Uh, which comes from our collections. And I've got such wonderful people working uh, for me. They go down, they look, and they see what could really appeal to you. So this time, we have a, uh, this is a facsimile. It's not, we're not giving away our real Can't collection. 
<laughs> Sorry. Not the original, is it? Not the original, no. But I, I hope you all can see from up there. This is a collection of songs. This is like the first sheet music that was composed by an African-American composer in the United States, what? in America. It was published in 1818, 1818. in yeah. Philadelphia. Yes, and it was by Francis Johnson. And he was a very, very popular uh, band leader, dance band leader. Okay, I'm gonna, they can see it up there. You, you look at it, and then we're gonna. <laughs> I'm, I'm bossy, sorry. <laughs> and I'm Vanna White. No, well, no, we'll, we'll do that. So, I am so sorry. I'm, I'm used to Vanna. having the, 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 go right ahead. Yeah, so, so this is, um, sheet music from this dance band. This man had this fabulous orchestra. He was one of the first that, and this, I wanted to show you this, this, you can help me with this. Thank you. You hold this side. All right. And Dr. Now. Hayden will sign this. So this is accordionized, and this has been done by our conservation department. Experts. Here at the library. They make all of this acid free. Everything has been done here. With his name. Yes. And um, so back to uh, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> After um, he uh, toured uh, Europe back before, he was one of the first bands to mm -hmm. tour Europe. He performed um, for Queen Victoria in Buckingham Palace. And what, he, what, what time was this again? 18? Th it was, this was 1880. He died in, in 1844. 18. 18. So um, he, but he hired the best African-American performers and they then went on to compose music themselves, form their own ensembles. He was really, he was actually very much like you in American Idol. <laughs> You know, he, I, I'll take that as a major compliment, he, right? <laughs> to he, that. He, he was um, nurturing the careers of other uh, really of other, yes, of, yes, of other yes, performers. Yes. yes. So, this is for you, and I we wanted to just thank you so much for well, agreeing to I am be our Gershwin <laughs> Prize. <laughs> am, Let's see. I am honored. Uh -oh. I have done this. Right. I'll let you put that back. I don't know how that works. Yes. Here we go. Thank you. Here we are. Thank you very, very nice. much. We can put it here. If you, and that way I'll we'll Watch it too. Later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you. You know, what is so amazing is that just coming and walking down the halls of this amazing place, the gift is that I'm walking down the halls. Mm -hmm. The honor is to realize that you're going to be a part of these halls. And um, this gift right here means a very, this will go in my library until it, I return it to your library. <laughs> Uh-oh, Sue heard that. No, no, but it'll be much further down the road, I promise you. <laughs> we'll keep in touch. <laughs> A couple of questions. And this one, really, in terms of your creative process, um, how have the last two years affected your creative process? That's an interesting question. Um, it's, actually, it's actually opened me up. For the longest time, you get, um, I don't want to say jaded. You just get frozen. When I say frozen, I don't mean it like that. You need something to wake your spirit up. Um, and I remember writing in the 70s, um, just to be close to you, or, um, it's another song that I'm, but the point was, oh, excuse me, what am I saying? Zoom. Mm. Now, if ever there was a song that it's was describing right exactly how I was feeling, a young kid facing the world, I'm not sure who I'm going to be, I'm not sure what I'm going to be, 
but the world is screwed up and I'm trying to find my place in it. Well, welcome to 2022. Um, I'm trying to figure out relevance. I'm trying to figure out what do I say to a kid, to a young man, a young woman, a person, when they're looking for the future and the rules, the rules of integrity and humanity don't apply. You win at all cost and you don't care if you hurt someone along the way. Hmm. What world is that? And so, it opened up songwriting again. Because messages have to be given. I'm teaching in American Idol. What happens in American Idol is I thought I was coming in to judge talent on singing. What I realized was I got to American Idol and realized I asked the first question, and the first question was, so where do you live, young lady? And she said, I'm homeless. I wasn't prepared for that. And so I realized, before we get to their abilities, they need dad right now. They need a parent. They need somebody to give them a hug. Someone that says, I understand what you're going through. I'm here for you. I've just described where we are now as a world. The world needs a hug. We are in trouble because my mom and dad and grandma's rules, for some weird reason, they don't apply. And the other way makes no sense at all. So what do we tell our kids going forward when the reality is what they see is injustice? What they see is not justice, but just us. Now, what happens when you try to educate a future generation of integrity? So, songwriting is going to be a definite part because I figure not only is America, actually American Idol is going to be better than writing a song because that's 20 million people twice a week with one billion impressions. And I get to talk to the world talk to them every day by hugging that little girl from West Virginia or sitting there and letting this little girl or this guy who's homeless and putting the emphasis on his struggle because people think I'm going to sing, I'm going to get rich. Suppose you don't get rich and because and maybe you can't sing. Now what? Do I leave you out the back door and lose your send you home and crack a few jokes about you? No. I've got to figure out how to leave you as a whole person. And so for me, between never thought Papa Lionel <laughs> would be really sexy. <laughs> but it really got sexy. Because to have a nine-year-old stop me on the streets and say, hey, mom, dad. There's Lionel. And, and by the way, I want to go to Tuskegee when I go to college. Yay. But what I'm saying to you is it's a teaching moment now for all of us because we were raised by fine, decent people. The problem is now we have to get the world to understand that obviously the people who are running these different countries, obviously they weren't brought up with fine, decent people because murder and that's not on the plate. So I'm hoping that the songwriting and the mentoring 
people make a difference. Well, our last. I have more questions from the audience. However, we have time for just one more. So this gets to what you're doing in the mentoring. It said, if you could give one, and, and it's underlined, Richard, underlined it, one piece of advice to your 20-year-old self, what would it be? Lord, that was, that's hard. Uh, I would not get in the music business. I would, my dad was right. No, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, that's interesting because I would say it, <laughs> I would say it and then I would not subscribe to it. I would say it because um, my answer would be, don't be so trusting. Um, um, but I have found that what comes with youth is naivete. There's a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of not knowing that the world would destroy you that makes life exciting when you venture out on that. And you can always tell when you're going in the right direction, your parents are scared to death. But you know you're going in the direction that they would never go in because that's too logical. And I would say to myself, if I really had that, trust yourself. Trust your thoughts. I have people walking up to me all day, every day, Lionel, if I were you, and my answer is, thank God you're not. <laughs> <coughs> because that's what it is. I kept thinking that God was going to give easy to all of us. He gave it to me. She gave it to me. In other words, what I'm saying to you here is, your connection to this universe is singular. You might have come in as a graduating class, but only one, you got the notice. Trust yourself to go forward with it. That is my secret to you. If I pass anything on to you, don't doubt, lean forward. Mr. Ritchie, thank you. I'm it's having the best time, time of my life. Huh? Well, thank you for spending the time. There's a concert on Wednesday. Yes. And then the concert will be broadcast May 17th on PBS. Check your local station. Oh, that's going to be fantastic. Oh. And it's going to be something. So thank you for spending this time with all of us in person and virtually. We really appreciate it. Thank well, you. Well, let me just say, before, before I, this is, you know, I, I should be actually telling you there's a, there's a quality I want to pass out to everyone that's listening. Um, if you ever have a chance to not grow up, um, I know your kids will make you grow up, but don't lose that childlike wonder. Um, if you decide you are going to be a grown-up, it's over. Um, the, the, the adventure to life is being that child. And nurture your child as much as you can because that will keep you alive and present for a very long time. Thank you so much for this honor tonight.
Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, you doing here? No, I'm good. All right.